Hi, this is Dr. Kat Fleece again from Central New Mexico Community College presenting to you video B that covers the anatomy of the urinary system and also the two reflexes that occur in the bladder. If we just focus on the urinary tract of the urinary system, it does not include the kidneys. What it does include is the ureters. There's a ureter per kidney. And each ureter guides the urine produced by the kidneys to a storage unit we call the bladder. And leaving the bladder, we have the urethra. So don't confuse with ureter with urethra. Since we're looking at this picture, I'd also like to point out some uh, of the vessels that we see here. Notice that arising from the aorta here, that we have direct connections with the um, kidneys via the renal vessels, the renal arteries right there. And then of course here we have the inferior vena cava which directly drains the renal veins right there. The aorta splits as it enters into the pelvic area into the two common iliac arteries. I'd also like to call your attention to the fact that each ureter actually enters the bladder from the posterior side and kind of dips down and up before it merges with the bladder. There's a reason for why these ureters enter the bladder that way. By first descending and then curving up slightly before merging with the bladder, these ureters ends will close when the pressure in the bladder begins to rise. And of course, the pressure in the bladder rises when urine collects in it. So this helps close off the, the ureters and prevents flow of the urine back upwards into the ureters. By the way, these ureters are pretty rich in smooth muscle that are characterized by peristalsis. This is part of the reason for why it's so painful when you're trying to pass a kidney stone because the stone is going to cause these ureters to contract more, um, more often and more intensely and this can get quite painful. Let's briefly take a look at the histology of a typical ureter. We're going to see three major layers, the mucosa. The mucosa, of course, is going to be made up of the transitional epithelial tissue that is so characteristic of the urinary tract and that rests on a thin layer of areal or connective tissue which of course we call the lamina propria. We see a nice uh, layer of smooth muscle and then an adventitia layer. The bladder is a storage unit for urine and it can store about a half a liter to a liter of urine. We do have the desire already to urinate at a much lower volume of about 150 milliliters. So the bladder is adapted for being able to store urine, not just because of the presence of transitional epithelial tissue and smooth muscle, but also due to the presence of rugae, very similar to what we found in the stomach. So of course, a combination of all these things allows the urine to accumulate without the bladder accumulating or, or without the bladder building up all that much pressure. Now take a look again at how these ureters enter the bladder from the back at a pretty low level in the bladder. And where they enter we see these two openings here that form or help form a triangular region approximately like so um, together with the opening of the urethra, and that is called the trigone. The trigone is an area that is, has clinical importance because this is where pathogens like to hang out and create trouble and create infections. So when we have a urinary tract infection, often this is where they hang out in that trigone. Notice too that we need to point out some names of muscles. So the smooth muscle of the bladder interestingly gets its own unique name and we refer to it as the detrusor muscle. 
The internal urethral sphincter is also made up of smooth muscle. It sits at the junction of the bladder and the urethra. On the other hand, the external urethral sphincter is skeletal muscle and is under control of the somatic nervous system, therefore. So let's, so let's do a quick review. So the detrusor muscle is made up of smooth muscle. So is the internal urethral sphincter muscle. And finally, the external urethral sphincter muscle is made up of skeletal muscle tissue. It's important to remember which areas of a, an organ, which muscle areas of an organ are innervated by either the autonomic nervous system or the somatic nervous system based on whether the muscle tissue is smooth or skeletal so you can understand better how that particular organ is regulated. And that's something we're going to take a look at uh, shortly. The bladder is also lined with transitional epithelial tissue. You see that here in the diagram and here in the actual photo. It's going to rest on a layer of loose connective tissue, areolar connective tissue again, uh, followed by some more connective tissue. Here on this diagram, they refer to it as the submucosa. Um, you're welcome to do that as well here, this area here. And then we have the detrusor muscle, which really is made up of three distinct layers. We're going to see that it's made up of two uh, longitudinal muscle layers, smooth muscle layers. Remember, they follow the length of the bladder, um, while the circular fibers, the circular layer in the middle, which we can sort of see here a little bit of, those are fibers that go around the circumference of the bladder. And then finally, we see again an adventitia. Remember, we sit, we're looking at a structure that sits retroperitoneally. On one of the previous diagrams, I pointed out the two urethral sphincters with the, the internal urethral sphincter being made up of smooth muscle tissue, so therefore under control of the autonomic nervous system, while the external urethral sphincter is going to be controlled by the somatic nervous system because it's made up of skeletal muscle. We have control over that sphincter muscle. And that, therefore, leads us to two reflexes. One is called the storage reflex, and one is called the void or micturition reflex, basically the reflex that kicks in when we want to actually urinate. Both these sphincters are going to be closed, obviously, when we're just trying to store urine. The locations of both sphincter muscles are the same in the male versus the female. They're just more separated. So let's take a look at this. In the male, this would be the bladder area, while this would be the urethra. This, by the way, is the prostate, an organ that is not present in the female. We'll learn more about this when we learn about the male reproductive system. So the urethra in the male runs right through the prostate and then, of course, continues in the penis. So the urethra is much longer in the female, but the locations of the two sphincter muscles is basically the same. They're just separated with a greater distance. So right here, we have at the junction of the bladder with the urethra, we have that internal urethral sphincter, while right here, right before the urethra leaves the body via the penis, we have the external urethral sphincter. They give it some uh, strange name here, but it's really the external urethral sphincter muscle. If we take a look at the female on the right, we see, of course, the bladder here. This is the urethra. And at the junction of the bladder with the urethra, urethra we have the internal urethral sphincter muscle. And then here uh, at the level of the urogenital diaphragm, right here, we have the external urethral sphincter. So in order for us to better understand how we manage to store urine versus how we manage to excrete urine, called micturition, a fancy way of saying urinating, we need to learn a little bit more about how the bladder is innervated. So let's take a look at this quick sketch I created. 
So notice that on the left side here, I indicate which parts of this diagram are located inside of the body versus outside. This blue region right here represents the urogen urogenital diaphragm where the external urethral sphincter is located. Remember, this one is made up of um, skeletal muscle, while the internal urethral sphincter, which is located at the level or at the switch between the bladder to the urethra, is made up of smooth muscle. And then the detrusor muscle is also made up of smooth muscle. Let's take a look now at the nerves. We have three major nerves to consider. We have the so-called pelvic nerve, the hypogastric nerve, and then the pudendal nerve. The pelvic nerve and the hypogastric nerves are autonomic nerves, with the pelvic nerve carrying parasympathetic fibers that secrete acetylcholine. On the other hand, the hypogastric nerve carries sympathetic fiber which secrete norepinephrine onto the detrusor muscle as well as onto the internal urethral sphincter muscle. The pudendal nerve is a purely somatic nerve which will release acetylcholine and of course when acetylcholine is released by the um, somatic nervous system it is always going to be excitatory. Let's take a look now at the storage reflex, which is a, a spinal reflex because it involves primarily our sympathetic fibers in the hypogastric nerves that originate from the thoracic area of the spinal cord. Now, before you try to get this all memorized in your head, just think logically. What needs to happen when you want to store urine? You want to close both the... the um, urethral sphincters, right? And you certainly do not want the detrusor muscle to start contracting. And that's exactly what happens. So, during the storage reflex, we're going to want to inhibit the detrusor muscle. We want to stimulate both the internal and external uh, urethral sphincters. So if we go back to our earlier sketch here, then we're going to not want this detrusor muscle to contract. So we do not want these hypogastric nerves to become activated. So they need to be inhibited uh, because they contain the sympathetic fibers that could cause contraction of the detrusor muscles. But we do want the internal urethral sphincter to contract. So we do want these fibers that go from the hypogastric nerve to the uh, internal urethral sphincter. We do want those fibers to release norepinephrine. Now, at the same time, we have control over the external urethral sphincter, which is made up of skeletal muscle via somatic fibers in the pudendal nerves. These somatic fibers in the pudendal nerves originate from the sacral region of the spinal cord and they're in turn controlled by interneurons that are arising from an area in the brain referred to as the pontine storage center. Pontine referring to the pons, which is located, as you remember, in the brainstem. When urine starts to collect more and more and more in the bladder, we sense that and we sense that with the help of sensory fibers that are also located in the pelvic nerve. So the pelvic nerve doesn't just carry parasympathetic motor fibers that go towards our smooth muscle, the detrusor muscle, but it also carries sensory fibers that carry stimuli, stretch stimuli from the detrusor muscle into our uh, brain. We refer to this particularly as the pontine micturition center that is going to become activated. And the actual exact working of this pontine micturition center and how other higher brain centers communicate with this pontine micturition center is very poorly understood. So that's well beyond the scope of this class, well beyond me, quite frankly.
But we do know that at the level of the bladder directly are parasympathetic fibers that are part of the pelvic nerves as well and originate from the sacral area of the spinal cord. They're now going to allow for the detrusor muscle to contract. Of course, that increases the pressure in the bladder to help out to help with getting the, the urine out. But obviously that also means that both our sphincter muscles are going to have to um, not contract. And how do we allow that to happen? Well, we're going to have to make sure that the sympathetic fibers from the hypogastric nerve are not going to be fi firing anymore. And we're going to need for our somatic fibers in the pudendal nerves to also be inhibited. So we see contraction of the detrusor muscle, but we see inhibition of the internal sphincter as well as inhibition of the external sphincter. So in summary, if you really sit down and think about what should be happening to these three muscle sets, the detrusor muscle, the internal and external urethral sphincters during either storage of urine or the release of the urine, it shouldn't be too difficult to figure out what should happen when. The one thing that you have to pretty much memorize, therefore, is the names of the nerves and what kinds of fibers that we find in these nerves. Bear in mind that we also have sensory fibers that must always relay information about the amount of stretch that's occurring in these muscles, particularly in our example here, the uh, detrusor muscle. We're now done with the urinary tract and we're ready to move on to the kidneys. Lots of videos on just the kidneys, so be prepared.